this type of ministry i try to figure about how many services there are and feeling that the lord has given us some direction regarding a general pattern program we are wondering what we should leave unsaid and what we should say and that would be for his glory and for our good to me the bible is different than any other book as i've often said i never put it on trial before any book or any set of books or anybody or any set of bodies and the bible is supreme authority one of the dangers of our day is that well, the bible goes on trial sometimes i think men are not aware of what they're doing i read in our sunday school literature within the last or the last quarter i believe just a little comment that i wondered if the brother who wrote it knew what he was doing or what he was saying now i believe one should study the bible critically that is those who who are to be leaders especially i believe there should be a critical study of the word of god by that i do not mean destructive criticism but i do believe one can give the bible a critical examination and that it will stand up under that if we are open and fair but the statement was made maybe someone else caught it that uh, on the surface that is by reading the bible on the surface it would appear that the period of time was 41 years dealing with the period of time uh, leading up to Zedekiah, King Zedekiah. But then the comment was, when we compare this with the historical record of some of Israel's neighbors, it couldn't have been more than 31 years, something like that. Now, I don't know, in fact, I hope that whoever wrote that didn't know, know what they were doing, but actually what they did was to put the Bible on trial before the so-called historical records uh, of Israel's neighbors. You see that? Why not put that record on trial before the Bible? If it disagrees with the Bible, why not? Why not? say well we discard that record for here's god's word now that's the approach that i make now as i read the book of god i have already pointed out to you that god cursed the earth that's in genesis 3 19 cursed be the earth for cursed is the ground for thy sake but in revelation 22 the record is and there shall be no more curse and that doesn't say just the curse is going to be lifted it's to be lifted for keeps there's a permanent lifting there shall be no more permanent uh, now the story of the bible between those two statements is one of sin with its tragedies and salvation with its wonders cursed is the ground and there shall be no more curse one end of the bible you have the curse coming the other end of the bible you have it lifted and lifted for keeps uh, i'm always glad when young people come around and ask me questions i told somebody they were older when was talking and i uh, here on the platform and a couple of young fellows were here wanting to ask me questions i don't mean to be rude at all but I'm interested in young people. Sometimes things that are said here uh, may get hold of their mind. And I, uh, I wanted to answer questions that they had. And they were talking about the rainbow. I'd mentioned it yesterday. God put a rainbow in the cloud as a covenant between God and man that he would never again destroy the earth uh, with a flood. 
we discussed just a little or suggested some cause for that. From the record I, uh, in Genesis 2, I deduct the fact that it had not rained prior to the flood. And that when the flood came, the whole system, uh, atmospheric system would be changed and God put a rainbow. The watering of the ground would be from above instead of below. For the record in Genesis 2 is that there went up a mist from the face of the ground and watered the whole earth. And then the statement, God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, but that was the method by which the ground was watered. <clears throat> but with the water in the clouds above, the, <clears throat> uh, the raindrops in the clouds would uh, make us the rainbow. But I <clears throat> would suggest to you that <clears throat> When the Bible is through, the rainbow is gone. Now, in uh, Revelation chapter 4, when John is caught up to heaven, he sees the throne, but there's a rainbow around it. In Revelation 10, when the mighty angel, whom I believe and most commentaries that I know of believe to be the Son of God himself, comes down from heaven, he has a rainbow on his head, puts one foot on the land and one on the sea and lifts a hand to heaven and swears by him that liveth forever and ever that <clears throat> there shall be no more delay or time shall be no longer. But when you take a look at the, at the <clears throat> throne of God in Revelation 20, the rainbow's gone. In other words, the mercy, mercy has exhausted itself and judgment now is going to be that that will send men to hell for nobody who comes before that throne at that time is going to make it to heaven. I don't want to get in that area. That's an area all by itself. But the Bible certainly talks about two resurrections that are out in the future. One is specifically called the resurrection of life, Jesus talking. The other is equally as specifically called the resurrection of damnation. And I would affirm in that area, without going into that at all, that from the first resurrection, no one will be lost. <laughs> Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. From that resurrection, no one will be lost. From the next resurrection, no one will be saved. It is explicitly called the resurrection of damnation. But I've said the wonder is that we have a chance to choose which one we want to get in on. If I want to get in on the first one, all the powers of heaven are in my favor. All the grace that God has for man is for me. If I want to make the first one. But if I don't want to make the first one, I'm going to come up anyhow in the second one. Whether I want to or not isn't the issue. I can reject the call of God to repentance. He calls us to repentance. He leads us to repentance. He commands us to repent. He teaches us to repent. God does all of that. I can resist all of that and reject it. But when he calls me to the judgment, I'm coming. Without any pullback, I'm coming because he calls me. But uh, we had in the, in the uh, course of our discussions yesterday morning, up to yesterday morning, we had gotten over to Noah coming out of the ark or in the ark, the fact that he came through the flood he had built an ark, and we suggested that it would take more than a primitive man to build such a thing as the ark, have it watertight from the time it first touched the water, to carry the cargo that it must carry across the flood of water. But again, I would recommend that all of you who can and you could, if you find it, I don't know whether it could be checked out at the city library, 
that you read the book The Flood by Ray Winkle. Ray Winkle is a Lutheran man, I think, still living, still teaching. It's a book maybe of three, four hundred pages, I don't just remember. I bought a copy, and I have a daughter, one daughter, that's, well, I have a couple, but one of them who was teaching in the public school who borrowed it. She uh, read it and was so interested in it, she loaned it to another teacher. That teacher read it, loaned it to another and another, and when I wanted it, I didn't know where it was, she didn't know where it was, and I couldn't wait, so I bought another copy. Well, my... <coughs> I used that, and my son borrowed that. I don't know where that was when I wanted it, so I bought another one. And I don't know who borrowed that one, so I bought another one. I don't object to that if it, if it does business. My daughter said, Dad, there's never been any book circulated in this group that has ever done what that book did. Well, get a hold of that statement the fountains of the deep were broken up. And the suggestion is that not only did it rain from heaven, but there was a terrific upheaval in this earth. It wasn't just rain coming from above. There were a lot of other things involved in the flood. Might be good for us to do a little thinking about. <clears throat> but uh, I don't want to linger there. I'd like to point out some things that I think are of vital importance to the day in which we live, <coughs> picking up Noah on this side of the flood and running down, if we can, uh, to the days of Nimrod and maybe on down to the days of Abraham. But when Noah <coughs> came out of the flood <coughs> in chapter 9 of Genesis, you have the record uh, that he built or he planted a vineyard. He began to be a husbandman in uh, Genesis 9:26, or pardon, 9:20. Began to be a husbandman and he planted a vineyard and he drank of the wine, was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. Ham, the father of Canaan saw the nakedness of his father, told his two brethren about it. Now, somebody would say, why did Cain get drunk? Or why did uh, Noah get drunk? I do not know. I'm uh, not a scientist nor the son of one, but someone has suggested that... <coughs> Prior to the flood, the atmospheric condition was such that uh, the juice of the grape or the fruit would not or did not ferment. And that after the flood, Noah did what he had been accustomed to doing for 600 years. He planted a vineyard and drank the wine of it, but something had happened to it. And he became intoxicated. And... Uh, was in that condition in his tent. Well, be that as it may, I know there are men who have been made drunk when they didn't know what they were doing. I mean to say they were unaware that what they were drinking would intoxicate them. I know that uh, even now. But uh, here's a man lying in his tent door, drunken, uncovered. And I have tried in my own mind to reenact what went on that day. And I have rather <clears throat> suspected that Canaan was the first one to look at his granddad, see him in that condition, because Noah cursed Canaan, the son of Ham. But whether I'm right or not, the rest of it uh, would be all right. But I've thought of Canaan coming to see and going and telling his father Ham. And Ham went and looked and was going to make his father a public spectacle. <clears throat> and he went to his brothers and told Shem and Japheth about it. And the record is that Shem and Japheth 
took a garment on their shoulders and went backward and covered their father without looking. Now, we're in a day when nakedness is thought nothing of. I find people running around their homes without a shirt on me, and, and, and I, I object to it. I never saw my father with his shirt off in my life. Of course, I died when he was eight, but that wasn't the custom back there. I mean to say our generation is sinking somewhere in certain areas. Somebody said, you ought to join the army. I was in the army. I know about that. <clears throat> but that doesn't change the fact that God put something in my heart when he saved me. In fact, I think I have something that he could build on even from before that. <clears throat> A lot of folk make fun and call it false modesty. I'd like that defined. In all the record of God's book, you never saw a naked angel. You never read about one. You never get a vision uh, or any kind of a revelation of deity naked. He's always clothed. Angels are always clothed. Every place you read about them in the book of God, they're always that way. God had some pretty rigid rules about those who served him around the altar. They weren't to be naked. Their nakedness was not to be looked at. <clears throat> when I see a lot of things that I see, somebody said, you're an old fogey. I know that. <clears throat> But when I see a lot of things that I do see, I wonder what people think there is about <clears throat> what they're trying to show that is nice to look at. <clears throat> but here's a man lying uncovered in his tent. Two boys go backward. They cover him without looking. When he awakens, note now, when he awakens and knew what his younger son had done unto him, verse 24. And he said, cursed be Canaan. That's the son of Ham. The Canaanites were to be utterly destroyed when Israel went into the land. But then he said, blessed be the Lord God of Shem. Blessed be the Jehovah Elohim of Shem. Blessed be the covenant-keeping Almighty of Shem. In other words, God is going to keep his covenant through Shem. What is that covenant? The seed of the woman is going to bruise the serpent's head. We went over that at an early, in an earlier service. Seed of the woman in the garden. The seed of the woman is going to bruise the head of the serpent, but be bruised while he's doing it. And that covenant is going to be kept through Shem. For those that Lord God, the Jehovah Elohim, the covenant-keeping Almighty, the one that will keep covenant with man, is going to do it through Shem. You come down through the lineage in Abraham was a Shemite. But then he makes a statement. God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem. The Japhethites are going to be enlarged. And while God keeps his covenant with Shem, he's going to put Japheth into the tents of Shem. <coughs> You know when that happened? You go to reading the 11th chapter of Romans, and you read beginning about verse 17 that the tame olive branch was cut off, and the wild olive branch was grafted in to become a partaker of the root and fatness of the olive tree. But you go back to Matthew 21, and you find Jesus riding up the hill on a donkey, 
and going over to the temple. And there in the temple, they cavil with him about how he has authority and where he gets authority to do what he does. And in Matthew 21, 43, he makes a statement. The covenant shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. We're going to take this away. You, you fellows have had this covenant all these centuries. And here's the king. Here's, here's, the, here's the savior. Here's, here's the redeemer. He's come, as the prophet said, riding on an ass, meek and lowly. Uh, and you, are not, you haven't received him. You're rejecting everything that we are trying to do. <clears throat> and I'm going to take the covenant away from you. I'm going to give it to someone that will bear the fruits of it. <clears throat> you go a little further down, and in the book of Acts, chapter 13, you have Paul making his first missionary journey. He and Barnabas. They leave Antioch of Syria, they cross over to Cyprus, make a little trip through the island and cut over to Asia Minor, go up to Antioch of Pisidia, turn, around, turn right and go off down to Iconium, Lystra, Derby, and <clears throat> make a little trip back and come back to Antioch of Syria. But after <clears throat> they have the Jerusalem Convention in Acts 15, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back and see how the, how the <clears throat> converts are doing. And that's when Paul and Barnabas have their little disagreement. <clears throat> Barnabas takes Mark, whom he wanted to take, and Paul didn't want him because he, hadn't, he had turned back from the first journey. He didn't want him to, he didn't want to try him again. <clears throat> So Paul takes Silas, and he goes by land up around Asia Minor. <clears throat> now Paul, remember, was a Shemite. Jesus was a Shemite. <clears throat> the Jews were Shemites, and they were the covenant people. But they had rejected the covenant king. They had rejected the covenant redeemer. Now Paul, going up there, <clears throat> wants to preach the gospel in Asia. Asia was where the Shemites settled. And the Holy Ghost forbid them. You read that <clears throat> in uh, Acts 16. He was forbidden of the Holy Ghost. He wanted to go to Bithynia. Bithynia was a little coastal province up on the north edge of Asia Minor. <clears throat> The Holy Ghost wouldn't let him do that. He turned left and comes down to Troas. And there in Troas, in the night, he has a vision of a man from Macedonia saying, come over into Macedonia and help us. And it appears that that's where Luke dropped in for the pronoun becomes we. We <coughs> went across the sea and landed at Philippi. And the gospel had broken into the land of the Japhethites. <clears throat> but now let's stop there and note this. Shem was blessed. Japheth was blessed. Ham was neither blessed nor cursed. Now I have no antipathy against the black race. In fact, I'm a northerner. Maybe uh, I feel differently uh, than some. I have no antipathy against the, the black race, but we can't get away from the facts that are in God's book. We can do all we please, we just can't evade that. Here's a whole race, the descendants of Ham, that are left unblessed. Here's another race that were blessed, but then the blessing taken away from them. Here's another group that wasn't blessed, but now are blessed. <laughs> but 
the sovereignty of God over in men and nations is a little hard for us to swallow. But he's still God. <clears throat> Do you think there's any connection between this fact <clears throat> and the fact what I've related to you, the facts of history, that the Shemites moving to Asia did have some great philosophies, and there are moral, there's a moral content in their religions. Buddha, Confucius, there's a moral content in their religions. They builded great nations, they builded great cities, they had great culture. The difference between us and them is the gospel. You take the gospel away from us, and we're no better than they. It's the only difference. But down in the other section, the land of Ham, the land of Africa, there were never any great nations, no great cultures, no great philosophies, do you think there's any tie between that and what was said by Noah back here? I don't know, but I know that it's there. But you say, well, I'm glad we're in this. But do you know that with every blessing, there comes the, an attendant responsibility God didn't say that that race was damned. <clears throat> it's your business and my business to see that this gospel is gotten to every creature. For Jesus Christ died for the whole world. And he put the responsibility upon the people who have the gospel to see that it gets there. You say, why doesn't he send angels? I don't know. I know he's put it in the hands of men. When Cornelius was praying in Acts 10, an angel could come uh, in vision and tell him where to go find a man. Why didn't the angel tell Cornelius what he had to do? I don't know. He had to get a man. God's put that responsibility in the hands of men. Well, so much for that. They start out from the ark, and in chapters 10 and 11, you have what we sometimes refer to as the nations, the repopulating of the earth. We've already suggested to you that population can multiply very, very rapidly. <coughs> You don't think so, as we suggested the other day. You just take two and start doubling them. See how many times you'll have to double to be into the millions. Two, four, eight, sixteen, thirty-two. You just do that. You don't have to go very far to, until you're in the millions. But when you start with six, and there were six come out, came out of the ark beside Noah and his wife. And it isn't said, though it is said that Noah lived 350 years after the flood, it isn't said that he begat sons and daughters. <clears throat> but there were six, his three sons and their wives, you start doubling that, and it doubles pretty rapidly. 6, 12, 24, 48, and here we go. You just do it a little bit and it wouldn't be long till you're in the millions. And then the record is <clears throat> in the 11th chapter, shall we take a look? The whole earth was of one language and one speech. <clears throat> Came to pass as they journeyed from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shiner and they dwelt there. Now the land of Shiner. <clears throat> is the land of Babylon. They said, let us make brick and burn them through a lay. And they had brick for stone, 
and slime had they for mortar. Let us build us a city and a tower whose top and the words may reach our supplied words. <clears throat> Note that they're in italics. May reach unto heaven. Hebrew critics tell us that it wasn't a tower that was going clear up into the heavens, but it was to be a tower with a dome affair upon which was to be a, a replica of the heavens. <clears throat> For according to the Bible, there was a true <clears throat> astrology in those early days. <clears throat> For the heavens were to be for signs and for seasons. But like everything else that sin got hold of, it became a fallen something. A corrupted something. A corrupted science. We want to call it science. And we're in to something in this day that is a revival of something in that area. Duke University has been investigating the business of spiritism. I read their first report. Five or ten years they had been investigating. The Bible nowhere tells us that spiritism is something that is not, but it tells us it's something that's forbidden. I don't care whether it's a Ouija board. In your home, if you have one, you better get rid of it. A Ouija board, or a planchet, or whether it's the medium that you go to. Spiritism is a forbidden thing. And the Bible says you can't do it and go to heaven. Galatians 5, 19 through 21. One of the, there are 17 things listed there that you can't do and go to heaven. And then there's a phrase, and such like, of the which I tell you before that they which do such things uh, shall not inherit the kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God. <clears throat> Among them is witchcraft. We don't call it witchcraft, but that's what the Bible calls it. Necromancy, witchcraft, dealer in familiar spirits and wizards. Various terms are used. <clears throat> but there was a day when it was given by God. Now, when I read the little item in Reader's Digest some months ago about this woman, Jean Dixon, in Washington, it kind of made me have wrinkles inside, if you know what I mean by that. Something. Well, I knew that way back one of our vice presidents under FDR made a trip uh, through Asia, Tibet, uh, Afghanistan, investigating this very thing. He was, he was looking into and following out the counsel uh, of astrologers. Less than a year ago, I read the book, A Gift of Prophecy, by Ruth Montgomery, which is the story of Jean Dixon. When I started to read it, to me, books have an atmosphere. There's something of an atmosphere just kind of seems to pervade the book. When I started to read it, I, I didn't know the content, but there's something in it just seemed to grip my heart, lying signs and wonders. That thing just kept pressing all through the book. I had that inner impression, lying signs and wonders. When I discovered that FDR had called her in and she'd read the crystal ball for him. Harry Truman had called her in, she'd read the crystal ball for him. JFK had called her in. She'd read the crystal ball for him. Mr. Johnson has called her in. She reads the crystal ball for him. But significantly, 
Eisenhower had never called her in, or there's no intimation of it in the book. I wondered if it could be his religious background. I don't know. She'll read the crystal ball to tell you which pony to put your money on down the racetrack. It isn't just uh, in the field of religion. She'll read it for any purpose. Then and when I came to the end of the book, uh, one thing that gripped me <clears throat> quite strongly, she talks about a, <clears throat> a sultry summer morning in Washington when she felt something shaking her bed. She was in bed yet. And then it came up under the covers, and it was a serpent. And it entwined itself about her body full length until its face was up in front of her face. And it coiled around her, was looking her in the face. She describes its jowls hanging down. She describes its eyes as so full of love. She told how it looked out of the window to the east, looked back at her, disentwined itself, and disappeared. She took that as an omen from God. I don't. She tells you that there was a man born in the, the Middle East in 62, who in the 1980s is going to bring peace to the world. Now, I'd like to leave that and pick up something else that dovetails in here. It was in 63, I believe, that I was sitting in the barber shop, <clears throat> waiting my turn in the chair. I looked over <clears throat> on the chair next to me, and there was a magazine <clears throat> with the picture of a man and a woman, young man and woman, looking as though they were gazing way out. And the leading article in that magazine, Look Magazine, was what 25 leading people of the world think will happen in 25 years. I picked it up and scanned it. Didn't have time to read, just scan. <clears throat> and I had to go to the chair. It was called, my turn came. But I <clears throat> noted the date on the magazine. I went to the... <clears throat> magazine store, but they'd all been sent back. So from the pulpit, I, I announced if there is anybody who has a copy of Look Magazine under that date, and you're not wanting to keep it, I'd like to get it. I received two that night. I clipped and filed one. I gave the other to one of my sons that is interested in these things. Those 25 leading people of the world included statesmen, politicians, educators, writers. Eleanor Roosevelt had an article. Just It was shortly before she died. She had an article in there. Billy Graham had an article. Billy Graham said something that, such as you might expect him to say, that the Bible said this and this. Whether it would happen in 25 years or not, I do not know. But David Ben-Gurion, the premier of Israeli, David Ben-Gurion said, 25 years from now, I can see a real United Nations of the world with Jerusalem as the capital city according to the prophet Isaiah. I took my hat off to Ben-Gurion. Here's a man that faced the world and said, Gentlemen, I believe the Bible. He never mentioned Messiah. He never said a word about that. But he did say Jerusalem was to be the capital city of the world according to the prophet Isaiah. But I wondered, why did he say 40 years? He didn't say 25 years from 23 but that would be 40 years from the time Israeli became a nation. 1948, Israeli became a nation. 40 years from there would be 1988. 
Do you know that there were 40 years on the other end of this dispensation from the crucifixion of Christ to the destruction of Jerusalem was 40 years? Do you know that in that period of time there were Jews very jealous for the law? James said to Paul, you remember, how many thousands of Jews there are that believe and they're jealous for the law. But when Jerusalem was destroyed, they couldn't carry out their program anymore. Forty-year period to make the readjustment from the ceremonialism of the temple to, to spiritual worship. I wondered if that's what's in the mind of Ben-Gurion. I don't know. I worked with Dr. Harry Jessup years ago in a camp. I heard him preach from the text, This generation shall not pass away till all these things are fulfilled. And he gave it the rendering that the generation that was here when these things begin to come to pass will not have passed until they're through. I tell you, we're in momentous days. You can look at it any way you want. Now, don't go out and say Emory's prognosticating dates and days. I am not. I'm looking at the things we're facing. I'm telling you some of the things that I'm running into in my reading. And I tell you frankly that in my heart, <clears throat> I haven't any question but that there are younger people in this camp this year that will be here when the Lord comes. In my heart, I have that feeling. Whether I live to see it or not, I don't know. But I most certainly believe we're so near the end. When I think that Mother Shipton's poem, and a lot of folk have quibbled about Mother Shipton and what she, whether she did or didn't, well, the, the encyclopedias, and I have a set of old encyclopedias, uh, and modern encyclopedias want to kind of uh, slush some things over. But Mother Shipton was writing before printing. Okay, it was invented. According to the data I have, she died in 1449. Printing wasn't invented until 1454. But Mother Shipton has something to say. I might have, might have a copy of that here. I don't know. I, sometimes I carry one around, just a, just a paragraph or two from, from the bottom. And she touches the same thing, writing from clear back there. And I saw this poem... Uh, in a book that was published in the 1800s, the latter half. So it isn't something that just popped up now, but if it was written back there, there are many things in it uh, that are fantastic. I'll just read. <clears throat> now a word in uncouth rhyme, or uncouth, yes, uncouth rhyme, of what shall be in future time. For in those wondrous far-off days, the women shall adopt the craze, to dress like men and trousers wear and cut off all their locks of hair. They ride a stride with brazen brow, as witches do on broomsticks now. Then love shall die and marriage cease, and nations wane as babes decrease. The wives shall fondle cats and dogs, and men live much the same as hogs. In 1926 build houses light of strong sticks, for then shall mighty wars be planned, and fire and sword shall sweep the land. But those who live the century through, in fear and trembling this will do, flee to the mountains and the dens, to bog and forest and wild fens. For storms will rage and oceans roar, when Gabriel stands on sea and shore, and as he blows his wondrous horn, old worlds shall die and new be born. Now, to me, the, the strange thing is that this woman, whoever, whatever she was, was writing about the same period of time that Jean Dixon is talking about. You say, what do you think about Jean Dixon? I don't think she's of God. How could she make all of this prognostication? Let me ask you something. 
How much do you think the devil knows about the history of the race? You think he has our history in hand? You think he knows from the days of Adam till now all that's gone on in nations? What kind of a being do you think the devil is? How much do you think the devil knows about current events in the world of which we're a part? How much do you think he knows about Russia, about India, about Africa, about USA? How much do you think the devil knows about it? The present, right now. How much do you think he knows about the future? The record is that at a certain point, he'll know that his time is short. Do you think he knew that the seed of the woman was to be born and that's why he was trying to kill him as a baby? Do you think that's why he tried to keep Christ away from the cross? Why do you think the storm came up on the sea while Jesus was asleep in the ship? How much do you think the devil knows? Do you think he could make known to one of his devotees what the future is if it had no moral content? To serve his own ends? Well, I tell you, I don't question it at all. I could go farther in that. But anyway, here the human family has started over in the land of Shinar to build a great tower, and uh, they were going to enter into some kind of an arrangement studying the future. But the record is that God came down and confused their language, and they were scattered abroad over the face of all the earth. I'd have you note that. They were scattered abroad over the face of all the earth. Verse 8 of chapter 11. Scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build a city. Now, if you were to run down through, and I'll, I'll simply conclude this from making statements because of time, two generations after this, running down the lineage of Shem now, Two generations after this, the statement is made right in the midst of a, lean of, uh, a list of genealogies in uh, Genesis 10.25. Eber begat two sons. The name of the one was Peleg, for in his days was the earth divided, and his brother's name was Joktan, and he goes right on with his genealogical table. Commentators have looked at that, for in his days was the earth divided. I was a little surprised to find that Adam Clark has a comment in there, rather cautious maybe, but that it might refer to a dividing of the land mass of the earth. Well, that's what I think it refers to. The land mass, as I've already stated here, was one great body of land. And the people were scattered abroad over the face of all the earth. Two generations later, the earth was torn apart, divided into the continents as it is now. And that's been a providential thing. I'll just quickly tell you why I believe it is. When persecution broke out uh, in Europe, religious persecution became so intense. And it was time for God and his providence uh, to allow for some change in the program. There was a 75-year period back there that would parallel in that generation the 75 years uh, that are behind us. And some of you old heads know that a lot has happened in the last 75 years. We forget that back there we didn't have the conveniences that we have now. But you go back there and start with the inventing of printing, invention of printing, 1454 uh, and 1492, the discovery of a whole new world. America was discovered in 1517. Uh, Luther nailed his theses on the cathedral door. 
and the Reformation was on. And there was a place of refuge for those who were persecuted for religion. You think that was all just a coincidence? No, I don't. I think God Almighty had his eye on this whole thing. And the eye of the Lord is upon the righteous and his ear is open unto their cry. The steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord and I have reason to believe that in God's providence he just had everything arranged right so that this nation could be uh, settled and, uh, and uh, a place of refuge for those that were religiously persecuted. But where do we go from here? Where to now? Well, I don't think we'll have to go anywhere for things are winding up at a terrific pace. There are things happening in our day, but I want you to note that all of this, do I have two minutes more? Let me look. No, I'm right on the, right on the dot, so I'll stop. But I'd like, like to make some comparisons, and I will, the Lord helping me. And if he leads, I'd like to make some comparisons out of Romans chapter 1 with what we have told you today. I'd like you to think with me as you read through Romans chapter 1. There's two things, three things that are stated in that first chapter. We just uh, took one quick look at them uh, and not deal with them at all. Uh, but uh, I tell you, it's a picture uh, of the day in which we live. And then the consequences of it are certainly a picture, a further picture of the day in which we live. In verse 21, Romans 1 because when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful. Back there in that day, they knew God. How did they know? Noah had come over the flood. He was living yet. Shem was living. Japheth was living. They were living yet. They knew God. They knew about the flood. And when they knew him, they glorified him not as God. Jump down to verse 25 who changed the truth of God into a lie. Do you know that in the generation of which we're a part, they're tampering with this book? And if you were to take the religious world, I wouldn't be surprised to tell you uh, that you could find out that more people claiming to be Christians twist the word of God, pervert it, and make it teach what it doesn't teach than those that believe. They changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator. Man, if that isn't a picture of our day, humanizing deity and deifying humanity, down to verse 28, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. And then you go on to see what that led them into. First, they knew what God was and what he required, and they wouldn't do it. Next, they went to tinkering with his word, changed it to a lie. And as a result, uh, they were given over to a reprobate mind, uh, and here we go. I, if you'd have told me as a young preacher that I'd ever have to deal with sodomites, I'd have thought you were off the beam. But I've had to deal with them. Sodomites. England has passed a law. It's no longer against the law to be a sodomite. It's a social phenomenon. Man can marry man. And America is toying with that. USA is toying with that very thing right now. I tell you, brother, we're headed in a direction at a terrific pace, but it's judgment just around the corner. 